We have a wonderful panel here tonight with a lot of perspectives and expertise. Um, they're just going to tell you a bit about um, both their work and research and their uh, rough idea about what the future of farming will look like. So most enterprises will remain in some form going forward. But the one significant thing that you would see probably since the removal of milk quota is there will be a reorientation of our cattle herd over the coming decades that are there towards dairy production. So you'll see an increase in dairy production. Our arable area is around uh, 0.39 million hectares. Going forward, you would imagine with climate change, we might see a slight increase in that. But again, a 20, 25 in percent increase in arable production is still only a little over 0.4 million hectares. We're still left with a lot of grassland. The only long-term policy that the Department of Agriculture has is in relation to forest cover, where we're coming from about 10% forest cover and want to increase that to about 18% by mid-century. There's work to be done in terms of what are optimal grazing strategies and how do you ensure that family farms have a viable farm income on what are low output systems. So it's important that we try and maintain these. A lot of these are the biodiversity rich areas. So if you don't have farming, you won't have the biodiversity of what we consider typical at the moment in those. It's important that we put in place research programs that are trying to create interlinkages. What are the new opportunities for land use and farming? How do we ensure farming systems remain viable? What's the uptake of ICT? precision farming, sensor technologies to help farmers to be the most efficient they can be. I have a restaurant. Uh, I don't know an awful lot about farming, but uh, I do work with a farmer. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, he grows vegetables, I cook them. Growing everything from your basic spuds, turnips, uh, to uh, artichokes, asparagus, uh, salsify, and then the tunnels, then obviously the, the stuff that doesn't ripen so well in, in the climate. I'm not advocating from that that we turn the country in a, into a series of nine-acre farms. I, like that's not a that's not a viable model for for everybody. But what I what I like about it and what I find inspirational about it, well, for one thing, it's an incredibly useful, intelligent, and thoughtful way of approaching a piece of land in a way that the people who live on it, just two of them. But it's only nine acres. People who live on it make a living from it. And they look after it in such a way that when they leave it, they will leave it better than they found it. And I think that's an obligation that comes with all land. Here's my map. But I would love to cover much more of the country with uh, vegetable production and grain production and smart crops that, would produce, that can be used to produce higher protein foods in the context of all the information that's coming out on climate change and the relationship of uh, animal agriculture and its effect on climate change, I think the only conclusion we can come to really is that the cows have to go. So Ireland is basically bogs, forests and grassland, if you want to be very basic about it. And I come from the point of view of thinking about um, natural capital um, in, in, the, in the country. And these are basically the, the land, the, the physical and biological assets that we have on the land, and the products and services that we get from those physical assets and biological assets. We get um, water filtration and water provision. We get flood mitigation services from the bogs that hold back the water that would otherwise go rushing into these catchments when we have these big dumps of rain. Um, we get um, shelter, we get carbon sequestration. And when I started to think about what, what are we going to be farming, um, you know, 40, 50 years time, um, we're going to be farming carbon, we're going to be farming water, we're going to be farming culture. In fact, we're going to be farming tourists. We don't think about our landscapes as actually farming tourists, but that's what we're doing. And part of my own research is trying to work out how um, biological diversity, the diversity of grass and plants in a pasture, actually affects the productivity of those pastures. Um, other research going on here looks at um, uh, fungal endophytes, how the little, the fungi that live within plants can make them more resistant to disease um, and lessen the, the, the need to use pesticides. Um, other research going on um, looks at how we can manage our field margins better to provide places for pollinators which can increase crop yield and crop quality. So actually utilizing what we have around us to get more value out of our agricultural lands is really important, as well as creating these new markets um, for the, the 2050 um, version of, of uh, the agriculture of the country. I am predicting that we'll have results-based agri-environmental schemes where farmers get paid for what they achieve 
rather than the forms and the sign-offs and so on. It's already happening in the burn to a significant extent and um, it's starting along the Shannon Callows and there's some rumblings around the black stairs that it could start to happen there too. And I'd love to see more targeted uh, farmers um, being given more freedom and more autonomy to do what they know needs to be done to protect the ecosystem that's providing for their production and at the same time tighter focus on actual results. So it's, it is a win-win and a results-based approach to um, agri-environmental schemes. If we carry on with the way we're going on, we're, we're toast. But if we start to use animals to build carbon in the soil um, and build that into mixed farming systems or build it into perennial cropping systems, we could um, help build, increase the amount of carbon in the soil. This is an agroforestry set up in um, Loch Gaul in Armagh. Um, here you have um, 400 trees a hectare um, with no reduction in stocking rate of sheep for the first 12 years. That is a lot of carbon in the tree, a lot of carbon then being brought down into the ground. Not conclusively sold on mob grazing, but as a solution for Irish beef and lamb to be more sustainable, I think it, it has a lot of potential. Um, so the grass is so long and tufty that it, it's trampled down, and that prevents the poaching by the animal's legs into the ground to prevent the flooding and all the problems we had in the uplands years ago. So you can see the natural herbage comes true um, as well, so it's, it's a more complex sword for the animals to eat, so it's more interesting, and the soil quality builds amazingly well. I was wondering if, if, if you guys um, they didn't want to talk a bit about uh, rural communities, uh, maybe young farmers they see coming in. Who, who and how are the people <laughs> that are implied in these solutions uh, going to change? You? In 20, 30 years' time, you'll be able to work just as effectively from the West Coast as you currently are able to from Dublin. Um, so we're going to be that connected. Um, and I think that can only be good for rural Ireland. It means that we can, we can work uh, and live um, outside of the main capital centres and be as effective in, in our work lives. But some of these things we talked about, mixed farming, organic farming, vegetable production, they're all much more labour intensive in a good way. Because people talk, oh, it's very labour intensive, that's terrible. It actually means there's jobs in the countryside. So there are three very specific ways that jobs will be increased in the countryside. This is one of the things that has been highlighted in FoodWise 2025 the human capital potential of farmers. What is it and how do you mobilize it? How do you ensure that they keep up with the technologies that help to make scale of farming efficient and possible to do? Farming is becoming more demanding and it's extremely important that we protect our soil resource. And what Ireland has in abundance is that permanent grassland. You know, so yes, there is those concerns of if Ireland was to become an arable country, what you were doing to that soil carbon pool. You know, and it's how you protect the carbon pool is what's most important above and beyond anything else. Well, I'd like to see our natural capital assets treated as, as a piece of capital that we have and for investments to be made into the maintenance of these natural capital assets that provide for multiple goods and services and underpin um, multiple industrial sectors. For that investment to be treated like an infrastructure investment, like the investments we do into roads and into water treatment plants, you know, these, these grey infrastructure investments, when all of the sectors depend on these underlying natural capital assets, which we publicly need to maintain in order to maintain our economic um, success. Thank you all for coming tonight. Let me thank our panel. A round of applause.